Good morning, everyone. This is Nora Hardy from South Central Regional Library Council. It's 12 o'clock noon, so it's time to get started with our next wellness webinar. I have a couple of housekeeping things, and then we will get started. Delighted to have all of you. We've got people from Texas, from Virginia, from the middle of the country, as well as a lot from New York State, where I am sitting. Uh, I work for South Central Regional Library Council. We are a 14-county multi-type library consortium, which is quite a mouthful. What it essentially means is that we cover 14 counties, which is about 10,000 square miles in New York, southern New York State. Uh, we provide our members with education and training, of which this is one example. We also help with databases bought by the consortia for our region with uh, digitization projects. There's quite a few services, and we provide those services to all types of libraries. We have public libraries through their public library system. We have school libraries through their BOCES system. We have hospital libraries. We have academic libraries of all all levels, and we have special libraries such as the uh, International Racing Hall of Fame in Watkins Glen, the Corning Glass Museum's Rakow Library, a uh, lot of very interesting places, very, very different in size, scope, and audience. This grant is, this, well, this uh, webinar is part of a grant that we received from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, the Middle Atlantic Region Office. And we really appreciate it because it's been making it possible for us to offer quite a range of services as well as the webinars. I invite you to go to our recent presentations page, and I will put that into the chat area also, so that you can see uh, other webinars which have been recorded and have had captioning added to them, so they will be truly available to everybody. It tends to take about two weeks between the time we have the webinar, get the webinar edited, edited and posted, and then have the captioning added. So you'll see right now we have uh, webinars from two weeks ago and a week ago actually available to you at the recent presentations page. I just wanted to take a minute for those of you who have not had one of our webinars before or have not used GoToWebinar to introduce your command module to you. Uh, the area at the top is more involved in your audio controls. If you're having problems with that, you may be needing to click on the edit button in order to hook up your sound properly. You should be able to see the attendees. We currently have 19 showing. Uh, that's gradually growing. And then there is the questions area, which is where you can put it, type in your questions. I, advent, I recommend that you do this as they occur to you. I will see the questions, and then I will read them to Lanny at when she pauses for questions. If you are attending and hosting a group in a meeting or maybe a lunchtime forum type situation, please share your roster with South Central. You can either fax it to us or email it to us. I'll post the address for that also. That helps us to tell, to number one, know who all we're addressing, but also allows us to tell the National Libraries of Medicine who was benefited by this grant, and that helps greatly when we go to talk to them about doing additional things. Another benefit of doing that, if you include your email addresses, we'll be able to send each of the people who is attending their own evaluation to, pr to complete through SurveyMonkey. And there again, it tells us what we are doing well and what we could improve upon, but it also tells our funder what went well and what the outcomes were. So we really appreciate your taking the time to do that. If you attended a webinar in the past and had any problems with the links, please be sure and let the office know so we can fix it and give you the correct link. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker and then I will turn it right over to Lanny. Lanny Mulrath is the author of Fit Quickies, 5-Minute Targeted Body Shaping Workouts, and also 
The Plant-Based Journey, a step-by-step -step guide for transitioning to a healthy lifestyle and achieving your ideal weight. She is a guest lecturer in kinesiology at San Francisco State University. Lanny is associate professor in kinesiology at Butte College and is certified in plant-based nutrition through Cornell University. She holds a fitness nutrition specialist advanced credential from the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Recently featured on ABC TV, Prevention Magazine, and the Saturday Evening Post, Lanny created and starred in her own CBS TV show, Lanny's All Heart Aerobics. Recipient of the Golden Apple Award for Excellence in Instruction, she regularly speaks and writes about healthy living, plant-based nutrition, weight loss, and fitness. And now I'm very happy to present Lanny Morath. Hi, Nora. Thank you so much for having me back today. We're delighted to have you. Well, and thank you everyone who's come to today's session and I know some of you were with me last week and uh, I want to welcome you back and other people who weren't there here last week for taking the time from your day to come in. Um, I just got warmed up for the session with doing a couple fit quickies. I did seven seconds to a flat belly and I also did some um, of legs into play which we'll be doing again later today and I'm standing here at my standing workstation so if you were here last week and got some tips about sitting less and doing five-minute workouts, uh, three to five-minute workouts, then um, I hope you've got to squeeze them in this week. I am very excited today to be able to talk more about the nutrition portion of the program. And I'll tell you what, I am aware that of all of the people here today, there's probably m many people who have some idea about plant-based nutrition and some who may have not any idea about some of the benefits of a plant-based diet and yet for all of us we all know that we need to have lots of vegetables and fruits and whole grains and those kinds of foods in our diet so that's our starting point and yet I realize there might be some uh, more or less of a learning curve depending on your experience so bear with me I'll do my best to meet everybody's needs where they are and Nora has pointed out the questions section if you'd like to enter it within a question at any time so that's our start here. Uh, let me tell you, any time I get invited to share about the power of a whole foods, plant-based diet for ease of weight management, which is my specialty, I'm all over it. As someone who struggled with their weight for years, decades even, and I'll tell you more about that as we go along, I have found this simple solution it to be something that I just celebrate every single day because Here's the thing, all I ever wanted was to be full without being fat. Is that too much to ask? Well, I'll tell you what, before we get started further, I, there's something that we really need to make completely clear, and that is that to get what you want with your health and your weight, you have to go three for three. Now, I showed this slide quickly last week because I wanted to set the tone a little bit for moving forward. These three, movement, eating, and mindset, I consider the inseparable tools of body transformation. And when you get all three of these in alignment, you become unstoppable. So if it makes it easier, you can think of these three as the three F's, the food, the fitness, and the frame of mind. And of course, today we're going to focus on the food, but think about it. Before we leave this three, what I call the three pillars, if you can get control of your diet, you can get control over more than you ever imagined possible. And if you can get mastery or some degree of mastery over your habits and patterns of thinking, you can get more control over your diet. And when you get your body moving, you give muscle to the whole operation. Physical activity, as we were talking about last time, it restores brain power and physical confidence. It leads to improvements in emotional outlook, and it builds self-esteem no matter what your size. And when people get started on an exercise program, they feel more in control of what they eat. So they all work together. I can't emphasize that enough. But today what we're going to do, as I said, is focus on the 
food pillar. And it, I'll tell you what, even as these are so integrated, you're going to find that they tend to be all touched upon as we go through our time together. As a matter of fact, when I was approached by Penguin Publishing to do the Fit Cookies book, I said, well, of course I'd like to do a book about my exercises, but we have to be able to include all three pillars. We have to be able to talk about the food and the frame of mind, or it's really not an honest presentation of transformation. And they said, okay, that sounds great to us. So we had a great relationship for, you know, going forward from that time. So. What we're going to do is today, I think probably the, the best way to introduce you to this topic is to tell you a little bit about my journey, that the, how the plant-based eating approach can be so, make it so easy and be so helpful. And perhaps my experience is not unlike your own. But by telling you my story, I can give you the benefit of the, my experience as someone who sought and struggled, remember I told you for decades, to find the solution to a weight problem. And I'll give away some immediate takeaways. Here's our plan. There, I'm going to teach you the three rules of satiety, which are have been fundamental and core to an easy, successful weight to wrap your head around how whole foods plant-based can help with ease of weight management. Um, we're gonna, I'll teach you a two-minute move guaranteed to restore mental clarity and invigorate body and mind. And I will teach you a different position of the first one that I taught last week and legs into play. So it's very easy to learn just by hearing it. Um, I'll teach you a mini willpower workout. Remember I said I would touch upon all three, even though it focuses on the food today, the mental part and the physical part. And then I also have um, some bonus plant-based tips and of course Q&A going through or at the end as ever it comes up. So sound like a good plan, Nora? Caught we moved okay. with my mic off, yes. <laughs> Okay. All right, McCoy, we're going to go ahead and start with the food. When you say um, get healthy or lose weight, what you're really looking for is control over your physical confidence and energy, right? I really like to approach this from what people are looking for because that helps us connect with why we end up doing what we do. We're looking for protection from disease and we're looking for a better figure, right? You're just raising your hand and you're saying you want the freedom and the independence that bottom line depend on your health and your weight. And more than any other single factor, your health and weight depend on what you put on your fork because you truly do carve your figure with your fork. Okay, people look at me today and they find it hard to believe that I ever had a weight problem, but I did. And it doesn't help that everyone else in this picture is skinny. I'm the one on the left, in case you weren't sure. <laughs> now, I am one of those people with a genetic predisposition toward easy weight gain. I'm the one on the right in this picture, next to my skinny sister. And maybe you can relate to this. There is a genetic predisposition to easily gain and slow to lose. It means I... I I am slow to lose weight, and I do easily gain it, and I love to eat. So when it comes to easy weight management, the details of what I eat matter more than they might for someone who has never been weight challenged before. So my success hangs in the balance between energy intake and satisfaction from what I eat. Maybe you can relate to that. But if, even if you have, as I do, this genetic predisposition, for easy weight gain, which needs no explaining if you do have it. And oh, by the way, if you're one of those people who's always been skinny, can eat whatever you wanted, then you probably can't relate to this. But it may catch up with you sometimes, so you might be able to draw on this information later. But it's probably safe to assume that if you were at this session, that this is of interest to you, this how to, you can use your food to help you create your ideal health and figure. Now, even if you do have this predisposition, guess what? Predisposition is not destiny. The good news is that you can have a dramatic impact on expression of these genes. We'll just call them fat genes just to make it easy by how you eat 
and how you move. So let me give you an example. Maybe you've heard of lipoprotein lipase. This is real easy to explain. It sounds very fancy and sciencey, but basically let me explain what this enzyme is and then um, tell you a little bit about it. It's LPL stands for lipoprotein lipase. It's an enzyme and it is tasked with extracting particles of fat in your bloodstream and transporting them to one of two places, to your fat cells for storage or to your muscle cells to be used for energy. Now, where do you want yours to go? Think about it. Do you want easy fat storage or do you want this fat to be put, taken to your muscle cells for energy? Well, there is, if you have the genetic predisposition for easy weight gain, then your body is inclined to make, store in your fat cells, but there are two primary ways that you can affect this action of this enzyme, no matter what your genetic predisposition. One is to eat a whole foods, low-fat, plant-based diet. This has been shown in the literature. This diminishes expression of this gene. And physical activity, see how they go together? This slows down LPL activity in fat tissue, making it harder for you to store fat, and increases its activity in your skeletal muscles. So it's pushing that fat in your bloodstream into the muscle cells to be used for energy, right? So keep that in mind, and fat is something we'll be talking about a lot as we go along. All right, back to my story a little bit. Like I told you, I <laughs> have... Um, a uh, long and colorful diet and weight problem history. Now, this might be an odd picture to have in here. It's me, probably about four years old, and there's obviously some big chunk of me barbecuing on the spit next to me. And I'll tell you what, I, considering my current work and the way that I eat and how I coach, you can't help but agree this is kind of a humorous picture. And I'm sure my disgruntled look on my face has nothing to do with what's on the barbecue. But I, I put this in here because it, it talks about a time in my life. Um, as a child, I got a good start early on, in spite of this picture, from my parents with healthy living. I was always um, very active. We camped a lot. My parents had a big garden. My mom would freeze or dry everything that we didn't bring to the table. So I had a good start uh, at nutrition and awareness about um, you know health and well-being. And as I said, you know, I've had this long, colorful diet history, and here's from my, um, my wedding picture many years ago. I have been actually eating vegetarian for over 40 years, but that alone did not keep me as trim as I hoped. So part of what I'm going to share with you today is how even within being a vegetarian, that may not solve all of your weight problems, even though we might think, gosh, vegetarians are all skinny. Not necessarily so, as evidenced by, you know, this picture from, from me. And somehow, just a little aside, true confession, I always managed to be the person who served the cake at the weddings or volunteered to serve the dessert because, you know, you never know when you might fall into a big face full of frosting or something. Just to give you an indication of my interest in sweets and, you know, caloric food, even as a vegetarian. But as I, I wanted to let you know that I never let this get in the way of pursuing fitness endeavors. This is a picture of me running my first half marathon, and as you can see, I was weightier than I am now, but I just never let it get in my way of being athletic or my teaching and coaching of fitness. Um, for here, example, here's a flyer from my, my television show, and obviously, I was able to manage my weight for periods of time, and perhaps that you have had that experience too. You might have a weight problem. Sometimes you'll go for several months or maybe even years doing well, and then your weight problem reemerges. But that was my experience. You know, my weight would go up and my weight would go down. So there were plenty of times I could manage to keep my weight off for a period of time. But you know what I was looking for, you guys? I was looking for a solution that would go the distance without having to micromanage every single thing I ate. Maybe you can relate to this. Because eventually the tedium, and here, 
this is little slide talks about the tedium of micromanagement. This I brought up to memory from the days of the zone diet. I don't know if you've ever tried that where you had to to exactly balance grams of protein, carbs, and fat in your diet, and it was just excruciating mentally to do this. And it turned every meal into a science project, and I had very little, I had short-term success, was hungry all the time, and I just, my brain got totally fried. So abandoned that. But that's an example of what I didn't want to do anymore. I'd rather just be one of those happy and healthy at any size, people, if I was going to have to do that. So back to uh, further progress on my journey. Um, I have lost over 50 pounds, and that was probably about 17, 15 to 17 years ago. This picture was taken at that time. Actually, slightly un my, I had already started to lose weight at this point in time. Um, my high weight was 189.5. Notice, very important, 189.5, just shy of 190. Uh, in this picture, I weigh about 175, and now I'm always uh, under 140 a little bit and have maintained that easily for the last 15 years with the things I'm talking about with you today. So as I said, you know, it, it, through these weight struggles and trying to micromanage what I ate, and I just wanted to be full without being fat. And I kept finding ways to control my eating, but it always left me hungry day after day, and then I would have to abandon it. But oh, through all that, that period of time, I had one prevailing overriding uh, what would I call it? Not a thought, because it was much stronger than that. It was a conviction that my hunger signals couldn't be wrong or faulty. I couldn't be born with this need to be fed and be satisfied and have that be inherently wrong, meaning I would have to micromanage everything I ate every single day. And I put this picture up in here because, by the way, this is Rocky, our rescue squirrel. She crawled out of the woods and uh, actually was in, living in our yard for about two years. We nurtured her from um, a small stage of just barely a few days old. And she would sit in our laps and eat, you know, peanuts or whatever she wanted. And I put this in here as a symbol of this conviction that I had. Now, we live here in the woods in Northern California, and right now I can look out my office door, and there are squirrels all over the deck. There are some deer were going by earlier in the day, and they're all eating according to hunger and fullness. They're not saying, gosh, you know, it's not time for lunch yet. I, I'll have to wait a couple hours. And they're not counting their 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 grams of fat or protein, they're just eating whole natural foods that are meant, designed for them to eat until they're full. And, you know, there's no known obesity in the wild. The only animal kingdom animals besides us that are obese are the ones that are domesticated and, you know, the dogs and pets we have that eat from our table. So I have this always going for me. Even during all those years of weight up and down, I thought, why is it that I have these hunger signals and I have to think through everything I eat so closely? And I thought, what is it these animals have figured out that I haven't? Sure, I knew all of I knew about calories, and all of the diets I tried over the years had some kind of calorie counting component, some just disguised better than others. But depending on where I was with my success at micromanagement at any point in time, it kept me intermittently padded with excess weight. So what was I was missing? And I wanted more than just weight loss, because I could do that by staying hungry for day after day. But I also wanted to have a healthy, happy relationship with food, eating, and my body. And uh, here's what it came down to. Since I told you I was vegetarian, I found that I, um, over all those years, that I was suffering from something that I thought I had gotten over a long time ago, and that was, and there's actually a medical term for it, carbophobia. 
you may have heard of it. Carbophobia, according to, um, well, I've got the quote up here, it is actually a medical term that says a form of nutritional information infused into the American psyche through multiple advertising avenues that included magazine ads, telephone infomercials, and especially best-selling diet books. So what has this got to do with a plant-based diet? In a plant-based diet, the foods, if you're not familiar, are there's like five food groups. There's vegetables, which is high water content vegetables. There's starches, which is like starchy vegetables, like potatoes, yams, and sweet potatoes, and whole grains. There is uh, fruits. There is beans and legumes, and nuts and seeds. And within that realm, you are able to eat, to eat widely from a variety of those foods according to appetite, uh, meaning satisfying your hunger naturally and arrive at your naturally healthy weight. But an important part of that is distancing yourself from the modern prevailing attitude we have that carbs are bad. Carbs get a bad name because they're all lumped together. I tell you, any time I read an article about blood sugar or paleo this, which seems to be all or that, which seems to be all the rage now, they place, you know, the white bread and the processed foods and donuts, which do have a lot of carbohydrates along with fats and, you know, um, simple sugars, in a bucket with all carbohydrates, and it ain't necessarily so. When you are eating whole foods plant-based, you are able to eat abundantly and freely from all of these naturally low-fat, high-fiber foods, such as whole grains and such as potatoes and yams and sweet potatoes and beans. And you actually need to eat a lot of these foods to keep your energy and your weight up because you get a big quantity. I tell you, when you become a plant-based eater, your plate is piled high. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as, as we go on. But it can be scary for people who come from a background, which is all of us, perpetuated by the media and by the magazines at the checkout stands, you know, high protein, low carb, uh, melt off five pounds in five minutes. And this is in our subconscious, my friends, and it's killing us. It's creating a nation of osteoporotics because high protein diets do hammer away at your bones. Um, it creates all kinds of precancerous situations if you have too much animal protein in your diet. But that information will be in my upcoming book, The Plant-Based Journey. Today I want to stick to the weight loss portion of the program. So yeah, I, a, a friend of mine too and colleague, Dr. Michael Greger, actually wrote a book called Carbophobia, The Scary Truth About America's Low-Carb Craze. And if you find you are stuck in this problem, then that might be a good read for you as well. But I discovered that as much as I thought I was over it, I was holding back on eating the hunger-satisfying whole, more starchy foods that I've mentioned, you know, the whole grains and the, the um, potatoes and the sweet potatoes and yams. And it was causing me to be too hungry, and a, just a vegetable diet will not do it. Plant-based diet is not just eating vegetables. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Here's what I'd like to do. I want to teach you these three rules of society that made such a huge difference for me and how I applied whole foods plant-based to this. And I call them the three rules of satiety, but actually satiation and satiety are two different things. I just call it satiety because I don't want to go the three rules of satiation and satiety. It's just too um, complex. So I'm going to stick to satiety, but I want to be clear. Satiation is satisfaction of appetite that results in the end of eating a meal. You know, when you sit down and you go, time to eat, and then you're done, it's like, ah, oh, that was plenty to eat. Satiety, on the other hand, is that feeling of fullness that persists after you're done eating, suppressing further consumption. So like two, three hours after you've eaten, you still feel, oh, yeah, I feel pretty good. I'm, my digestion's going through, and I'll probably be ready for my next meal in another hour or so. But, you know, it carries you. And we all know that there are some meals that feel like they carry us more than others. So that said, and this is all laid out in the Fit Quickies book. Even though I'm going to be going into all this in much more depth in the plant-based journey, there is a whole chapter on nutrition and how I applied it for my weight loss in that book. So the three rules of the tidy that I'm going to share with you are weight, stretch, 
and energy and nutrition in that order. And weight, don't worry, I'm not, no one's going to weigh in today. You don't have to tell me your weight, any of that. But those are the three I'm going to talk about. First thing, I want to make it really clear that there are a whole lot of reasons for which we have hunger and by which we reach fullness and satiety and satiation. Many that we know a lot about, which I'll talk about today, and some that we've probably not even discovered yet. So that said, these three you can still use to your benefit without having a big understanding of why we have hunger and why we have fullness. So let's start with weight. Every day, this is fascinating to me, every day we eat about the same amount of food according to every as every other, according to weight as every other day. There's tons of research uh, out about this. I have it all, excuse me, referenced in the Fit Cookie book. But what this means is that if you were to take all of the food you ate today and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then tomorrow to take all the food you eat tomorrow and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then the next day did the same thing. I'm sure you you can see where I'm going with this. Each day, your basket would weigh about the same as every other day. Is that interesting or what? It means our body gravitates toward a certain amount of weight of food every single day. All right, so what does this, how does this connect with what you eat and have bearing on what you weigh? All right, let's do this. Let's take two foods easy to understand. Let's take cheese versus apples. And since we're talking about weight of food, we're going to take about a pound of cheese and about a pound of apples. If you can visualize them in your head, they actually take up about the same amount of space. I went to the market and found a chunk of you know, cheese. You all know what a pound of cheese, of cheese looks like. And about two apples is a pound of apples. So here we have a pound of cheese and a pound of apples. Now, Isolate the weight factor alone. I mean, by weight factor, I mean the weight of what you eat every day. Using that alone, which I know does not exist in solitary form in our digestion process, is just one of many elements. But isolating that alone, which one of these foods, the cheese or the apples, is more likely to cause you to overshoot your calorie requirement for the day based on weight alone. Okay. Uh, well, let me go back to that, actually. Before we get too far ahead again. Um, I, you probably, I, usually people get this quiz right, it's the cheese, because even though the cheese is it's taking up the same amount of space, it's about the same amount of weight. By the time you hit that weight factor of one pound, that cheese is thousands of calories a pound, where those apples are far lower in calories a pound. So if your body is responding to the weight of something alone, it's going to be the cheese that causes you more quickly to overshoot your calorie um, requirements, all right? Now, no one just eats cheese during the day, and no one just eats apples during the day, but my point is made here. The calorie density or the calorie concentration of the food that makes up the weight in your basket is going to make a difference between how it shows up on carriage, being carried as excess calories in your body. Okay, the next rule we're going to talk about is stretch. When you eat food, the food in your gut stimulates nerves in your gastrointestinal tissues, and these are called stretch receptors, and they fire off messages to your brain indicating that you've had enough to eat. All right, that's another one of our fullness signals. So let's take those same foods again, all right? Isolated from the weight factor, now we're just talking about stretch. We have, again, this quantity of cheese and quantity of apples. I told you an apple um, and the cheese, a pound of each, took up about the same amount of space. So now just switch into the space factor. Eating space-wise the apples or the cheese, which one of these is more likely or possibly could overshoot your calories need for the day by the time it fires off those stretch receptors? You see where we're going with this? Obviously, it's the cheese again. So here we have the cheese and um, the weight and the stretch factor. 
the cheese is going to give you far more calories before it hits those two. All right, let's go to rule number three. Uh, and uh, Nora, let me ask you, are there any quick questions, questions that have come in? Not so far. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, let's look at these two, um, compare them calorie-wise. Fresh fruit versus, oh, cheese and chocolate, which is about the same. All right, the apples and fresh fruits weigh in about 300 calories per pound, and cheese and chocolate are about 2,000 calories per pound, give or take. So that gives you a good indi indication of hitting the weight and hitting the stretch. Look at how many more calories you're getting, and we all know calories are connected with weight. All right, here's the last one. The third rule is energy and nutrition. The stretch receptor phenomenon is gives you an obvious sign of fullness because it gets those stretch receptors and the weight is obvious to you. But the one that we also need to pay attention to is energy. If you ever tr have ever tried just doing a vegetable diet, let's just I'll just eat salads for a few days and you know then I'll get this weight off or I'm no I'm just swearing off my carbs I'm just going to eat you know <laughs> my uh, my vegetables. There's a problem here because if you do not eat enough calories and do not get enough nutrition, your system is not going to work because your hunger drive is going to override everything else because it hooks your survival. You can get your survival. Yes. There is a question. Gary Spur asks, could you please show the stretch slide again? Went too fast. Oh. Okay. I would imagine they're probably, he's probably writing curiously to catch that reference. Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh, yeah. Haupt is, um, yeah, I, like I said, these are all referenced in the back of the Fit Cookies book, too. I know there's that you can download a section of the Fit Cookies book from Amazon. I'm not sure if the um, bibliography is in there. Okay. Oh, all right, where was I? Oh, we're talking about nutrition. Um, how important it is that you can't just you can't just take this information. I'm going to go ahead and move forward, and and say, well, I will just eat the apples and not the cheese because you won't have enough calories. You need to have. This is where the carbophobia thing is a problem. You see, when you add to your veg vegetable mix whole grains in the form of um, you know, brown rice and whole grain pasta and whole grain bread and those kinds of things, or sweet potatoes and yams and potatoes, you are going to get a more a more calorie concentrated item than the, the vegetables, but far under what's coming in with the cheese. And when you create a balance in your um, gut, it's actually, it's not just your stomach, it's your whole digestive area, with the, the weight and the stretch factor that comes from a good mix of all these whole plant-based foods, you fire it just right. You start to build naturally lean, healthy weight when you pay attention to that. This is why the cardboard diet won't work. You can't just think, okay, I'll stretch my gut with, you know, a bunch of brand fiber and, and cardboard and celery and that'll take care of the stretch and the weight. No, you also have to have the nutrition. So if you're not paying attention to this, if you're a carbophobic subconsciously, this one will come back and bite you in the backside every time. It also, here's the bottom line in this whole story with these three factors. Foods and edibles parading as food, we all know what those are. <laughs> that squeeze a lot of calories into a tiny package, think cheese, think chocolate, have the potential to add lots of calories to your meal before you've had your fill. So if you want your natural hunger and fullness signal to work for you, remember I told you that my conviction was that these hunger signals must not be faulty or wrong. There's a reason I have these, and I, and I shouldn't have to micromanage everything to be naturally trim. Well, the answer is the whole foods plant-based diet. You see how that works? All right, here's another example. Um, very important, and this one was a big one t for me to get to. If you want to be um, full before you're getting fat, it, the opposite way of saying, here's a way to, for you to get fat before you are full. 
Keep in mind now what we're looking at here is if uh, you are eating a big quantity of foods that are even, excuse me, small quantity of foods, um, any quantity of foods that are really concentrated in calories, they are, you cannot count on your natural fullness signals to take care of a naturally lean weight for you because you're going to keep overshooting your calories. And a prime example of that is expelled oils, which are all over our diets. Olive oil has 120 calories in a tablespoon. A tablespoon takes up like tiny amount of space. There is nothing in olive oil but fat. There's a trace amount of um, omega-6s and, you know, these essential oils that are far better for you to acquire in whole foods. Broccoli is full of omega-3s, by the way. Oil has been marketed to us in a way that we think that we really, it's a health food, so we start pouring it over all over everything. But you see how that gets us into, into trouble? It takes up no space in your gut. It doesn't really add any weight or stretch factor. You can down a lot of salad dressing on your salad and pack it, pound down the calories without having it fill you to satisfaction. Here is, in contrast, 120 um, calories of olives in you know, two-thirds of a cup. There's a big quantity. There's a whole plant food. All right, You can still get your olives. It should be in whole foods. So here you might be saying this. I, this always comes up in people's heads. But I'm always more satisfied if I have fat on my salad and fat the butter on my bread and all these things. Actually, the research um, doesn't support that. The in a research that is referenced, I believe it's on the next slide too. I'll see. They were interested in finding out if hunger intensity and fullness. Were, if there was a satisfaction difference if people had a high fat or a low fat meal. So they did research on this. In this particular study, there was a breakfast of 400 calories given to all subjects. Half of the subjects had added calories to that 400 of 362 calories of fat, and the other group had 362 added carb calories. Now these are in the forms of supplements, so it's, you know, it's something from the lab. It's not like either a piece of bread or a pat of butter. It was specifically the nutrients. And it was found that the carbohydrate supplemented breakfast suppressed subsequent calorie intake, but the fat supplemented breakfast did not. Um, just a quick example from one of my clients here. This is Karen, and I'll tell you, she really was she traveled a lot. She's a professional nurse instructor, goes to Africa all the time, was having problems with how do I get my diet in gear so that I'm not always having problems with weight. And she'd already started on a plant-based diet, but you know what we did? We got the oil out of her diet, and we got more uh, access, availability to whole foods and plant and in um, form of legumes and beans and vegetables and fruits. So she was well supplied with those so she wouldn't go hungry. And this is what happened over just a couple of months of time. And here's even her lipid profile changed. Her cholesterol dropped from 180 to 117, 8, 9, 11. It's like in four months over this time. You can just look at these differences. She made a graph here as well of it. But I like to put in there because it's fun to get a uh, visual of someone who's had the experience of just making simple choices like this, lowering the calorie density of the food she was eating, cutting out the oils, and increasing her uh, intake of low calorie density foods while paying attention to the moderate calorie density foods such as the whole grains and starchy vegetables. Does that make, make sense? So long short, if you don't understand why processed, fiber-free, high-fat foods are the problem, you will be stuck continuously fighting a war with hunger that you'll never win. You can't fight these the stretch weight factor that um, is part of our hunger and fullness signals. We are biologically driven to satisfy your urge. Yes. So this is uh, a picture persistent look at. Mm, Gary says, <laughs> what do you use instead of oil? 
Great question, Gary. I'll tell you what, there are now seasoned vinegars all over the place that you can get. My favorite is actually a sweet balsamic vinegar that I get at Whole Foods Market that's called Napa Valley Naturals. You can also get it online because I don't have a Whole Foods Market nearby. It's only a 4% acidity balsamic compared to the 6%, which is a little bit more acid. Um, or I'll just use balsamic. If I go to a restaurant and I say no dressing or dressing on the side, bring me oil and vinegar because the waiters can relate to that. And they bring that rack and I just use the red wine vinegar or oftentimes it's balsamic vinegar and put that on it. You can use um, lemon or lime or there's also many recipes. Um, I have one in my new book that blends up um, fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, like uh, sesame seeds and tahini, makes a really good base along with um, dill and a little bit of lemon juice and water to put as a dressing. So we it's a matter of acclimating your taste too. We're so used to these drenched salads and heavy dressings that when we move away from it, um, after just a few days, you start to notice the taste of the vegetables and the fruits coming through. Um, quite clearly and then the oil starts to seem like really heavy on it for you. So there, there are on the internet if you look up oil free salad dressings you'll find a lot there as well. Thanks Lanny. Yeah thank you good question. So we, I, I just want to make up to make this point. You have this biological drive to satisfy hunger because you have this biological drive and there is a way to meet it. You just have to satisfy it with whole real food. I like to say just because it's edible doesn't mean you should eat it. We all know that, right? So I call this, remember the old small tray, tr plate trick? You know, you're supposed to eat your food off of a small plate because then it would tell you that you wouldn't eat that much. Well, I always thought that was kind of funny because you can always go back and fill your small plate up any, again. But here's the thing. When you're eating whole foods plant-based, you actually have to eat large quantities of food because it takes up so much space. My refrigerator, you know, when I, I came back from market yesterday and it's impossible because there's all these heads of kale and heads of cabbage and bags of carrots and, um, you know, the fresh cooked beans I've got and the, the rice I cooked last night left over, all this food, it just takes up a lot of space. But this is what keeps you trim. It's a whole new way to look at things. I wanted everyone to know that there is a resource for you up on my website at landingmulerath.com. I have written the plant-based blueprint and I have a two-week sample of this. I mean a two-day sample of this up on my website you can download for free. And I actually walk, walk through some basic guidelines and a two-day example of what it looks, looks like on my plate. And then if you get, I have a gift for everyone who actually gets the Fit Cookies book. There's a two-week version, this beautiful 60-page, full-color version of two weeks of um, eating off my plant-based plate just to give you an idea what it's like. So I did want you to know there's a resource. You don't have to get anything for the sampler. Just go by and sign up for it. This is a couple pictures from it. Just to give you an example, I have some recipes in there. My favorite soup recipe, very easy to do. My favorite recipe is five ingredients or less, so um, if you can relate to that. I do not like to elaborately cook, I, but I love to eat, so I figured out ways to do it simple. All right, I squeezed in a little fitness break because I've got to get you on your feet in, in case you're not already. So if there isn't another question right now, I want to get everyone to stand and then we'll... Um, just take a few seconds for that and then get back to the Q&A at the end, okay? So if you would please stand, we've got to get you activated, get your brain going, put your feet in parallel, toes straight ahead, and your feet are right beneath your knees, right beneath your hips, and I'd like you to pull your abdominal wall in just a little bit and then grip your seat a little bit and then pull your ribcage straight up from your hips, shoulders back, top of the head to the ceiling. Now grip your glutes as tight as you can. That's your seat muscles. Straighten the legs all the way and start to tap your heels to the floor. And while you're tapping, you're only lifting. I'm going tap, 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 tap. You're only coming an inch or so off the floor. Remember from last week, if you were here, what this is doing is it's moving the lymphatic system as the calf muscles squeeze and it's moving the blood flow out of your low extremities back to your heart for reoxygenation, oxygenization, so you are going to restore mental clarity and 
willpower. We probably won't have time for a willpower workout today other than this, but that's why you're doing this right now. Pause for a second. Take a nice deep breath in. Reconnect with your beautiful posture, and then come up to the toes, down to the heels. Up to the toes, down to the heels, and come all the way up. Press the ball of your foot and big toe into the floor. Hopefully you don't have high heels on because you aren't going to be able to get very far. Two more. Lift and down and lift and down, and then place your right foot behind you for a calf stretch, toes straight ahead, and lean on forward. Don't you notice you have an increase, of course, in blood flow, your heart rate's gone up, pull the heel off the floor and back a little bit, push it back down, and then to the other side, left foot down, and pull the heel off, and push it back, and step back in, and you can either stay standing, if maybe you were standing the whole time, or go ahead and have a seat again. That move is excellent to throw in several, at least once an hour. Just pop it in and watch your energy and productivity increase. And you also restore the prefrontal cortex of your brain a little bit, which is part of the willpower workout. And uh, willpower, as we talked about last week, is something that comes in limited supply in your the beginning of your day and stress hammers away out of it. Add, add it all day, but you can restore it by doing exercise, breathing, and slowed breathing, meditation, and slowed breathing exercises, and restore that command center. All right, had to sneak that in. So let's go back to the uh, plant-based bonus tips, because I want to be sure to get through these and answer any other questions that you have that come up. We have about 10 minutes left, Nora. That's right. Do start typing now if you have a question, because it always takes me by surprise how, long, how much longer it takes <laughs> me to type a question in than to simply verbalize it. Okay, thank you. Um, at the top is keep it simple, and uh, of course, if you're brand new to the idea of what a plant-based diet is, you might be going, what, what, is, what is a simple way to look at this? And that's what my next book is all about, um, how, to, how to make the transition. But really, even if you don't, are, are not in a place right now like, I want to switch all the way to plant-based diet, that's not important. What's important is take the, the tips that you've got today about how those whole foods can make such a difference in your hunger and your fullness, hunger satisfaction, your fullness and satiety, transferring to your weight, and start to incorporate more of these foods in your diet. The uh, the American guidelines for uh, dietary guidelines are five to seven fruits and vegetables a day, and that's you know I easily double that. But that's a place to work toward. If you're getting like two to three servings of vegetables and maybe one of them is ketchup then start adding more each day so, and ease your digestion in. Start having up to a cup of beans a day. If you are not eating be any beans now, start with a, maybe a quarter cup, just a little bit, and work your way up. Those are a magic food. They are the ultimate skinny food. They give you the longest satiety and, um, and satiation because they, they fill you up, but then they last and last. They have what's called the second meal effect. So even when you're hungry for the next meal, they are um, appetite moderating for the next meal. And see if you can see where this carbophobia might be showing up for you. You know, if you're afraid of even the most healthiest, you know, potatoes and bread, it's these days it's like rawr, even brown rice. Start to look at it new. And if you're trying to manage your weight by really cutting back on all these high fiber foods in your diet, this may be part of your problem. Another tip is to eat to satisfaction from your first meal. So when you do eat your first meal of the day, have high quality, high fiber foods ready to go. Notice I didn't say breakfast because everyone says, um, everyone sees breakfast as a certain time, like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. or 9 a.m. But actually breakfast to me means any time you break the night's fast. So if you're a person who doesn't like to eat till 11 a.m., no problem unless you find that at 11 a.m. you're always so busy and nowhere near quality food that you grab the nearest low fiber, high sugar, high fat food that does not help you out with it in, in light of these three rules of satiety. See what I'm saying? So being prepared, and I address this in the upcoming book too, lots of tips and tricks about how to do that. We'll have to have another conversation with that down the road, Nora. I have a lot of information to help people with. 
Um, pay attention to the process continuum. What does that mean? We all know, we've all heard of refined foods, right? We know like white bread is a highly refined food because all the fiber has been taken out of it. Um, that's like a highly processed food. And when you go back to at what the original food, that white flour, which is in white bread, comes from, it's a whole wheat berry with the bran and the endosperm and the fiber and everything. Think about eating more of your foods, the whole plant foods, back at the beginning of the process continuum where they have not been ripped and shredded apart and had their fibers and other nutrients extracted. That's going to help you in light of these three rules. Um, number four, I have preface with the perishables. Perishables are more of the watery vegetables like, you know, greens and carrots and celery and radishes and cucumbers and all those things. If you start off your meal with your salad and then progress from there to your potatoes and your sandwich and all of those things, then you have a head start on meeting those stretch and weight satiety signals in your body. So you help your out. You don't limit it to them, but instead of just starting with, you know, eating a few pieces of bread and then finishing with the salad, reverse it. It will help you take up that space and then be sure to add enough of those weight and heavier, more calorie dense foods to balance it out. Next to prepare, this is goes along with the uh, set of first meal, being ready for that breakfast whenever it is. You can't eat what you don't have, right? And if you are someplace, what you have is what you'll eat. And if all you have is the goodies on the break room table or the vending machine down the hall or that, you know what I'm talking about, your hunger is going to drive you to eat whatever's there. So be prepared. Um, and level the playing field. Remember, if you are looking to have natural hunger, appetite satisfaction and be a natural lean weight, you have to lay the level the playing field with what is on your plate. You can't just do donuts and uh, double macchiato whatevers and expect that you're going to be, your fullness is going to keep you trim because you will remember, far overshoot your calorie requirements so easily that way. Detecting the dance, I use that to find out where are the problems in your day that you're not supporting yourself in trying to achieve a healthy ideal weight. Um, are you not being prepared with the food you need for a good lunch, a good mid-morning snack? Um, are, are you not good at having your kitchen stocked at home with fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains and a pot of baked potatoes and all of those foods to, to support yourself. That's the best thing way you can do to support yourself going forward. So there you have it. Um, I hope I've given you some really good tips about how you can immediately apply adding more plant foods to your diet to help you with more um, natural weight management make it far more easier. Lanny, I, I have a comment I'd like to add. I've just started carrying either dried fruit, I keep some in my desk as a matter of fact, so that it's there when I neglect to pick up the banana on the way out the door or mm -hmm. whatever it was I was intending to take with me. Or, you know, things get busy and I cannot break away at lunch. At least I've got some nutritious things to, to uh, tide uh -huh. me over. Nice. Did you have a slide where people can reach you? I'm, I'm not seeing any questions oh, right go. now. Maybe they're still... Ah, okay. perfect. Yeah, there's my website. And remember, I said you can go there to get the uh, plant-based blueprint. And there's the free sample for you. Oh, I know what I wanted to bring up also. This is especially since I brought up paleo and everyone's, everyone seems to have heard that. I'm doing a webinar, not, not a webinar, it's a webcast teleseminar next Tuesday. You'll see it on my blog. You can sign up for it. It's free. I'm going to have as my special guest the author of a new book that's just come out called Paleo Vegan. So if you want to see how you can, might be able to mesh this idea of lots of whole plant foods with this paleo concept. Isn't that a great title, Paleo Vegan? It's just really been going off the charts in sales because it's most of us think of those as being opposite. But Ellen Jaffe-Jones is the author of that, and uh, she'll be 
talking a little bit about the book and also um, answering questions live on the call. So that's next Tuesday. You can sign up at LannyMuleRath.com. You'll see it right there. It's the most recent blog post. Lanny, is that going to be available as a recording? Because I'm going to be tied up with our own webinar next yes. week. Yes. Oh, and good. everybody, when you sign up, um, that's, a, that's the way you get the recording. When you sign up, I will always send out within a day an MP3 recording of the, the audio. We do have yeah. a couple of comments now. Uh, Tina Winstead, who was the director for the Healthy Libraries, Healthy Community, Ladies Project asks, do you take supplements to balance your, balance your diet, especially with vitamin B12? I do take vitamin B12. All the other, that is the one thing that all plant-based diets, diets need to supplement with. Other than that, you can get what you need with the varied foods and whole foods plant-based diet. Remember that B12, it's a bacteria that actually grows on contaminant. And since we're, our food is so sterile these days, you know, we used to be able to pick carrots out of the ground and it'd have dirt on it and we'd gnaw on it and get our B12. And animal-based diets or, or diets with animal food have B12 in them because of the contaminants in the gut of the animal. So really it's coming with contamination. So yes, B12 supplement. Ew. Great question. <laughs> yeah, see, we don't know well, these no. things. No. Uh, the other comment is just to thank you for the lots of great hints and wanting oh, to know good, when your good. when your new book will be out from Deborah Lang. Not till 2015. I'm just oh. so sorry to say it's coming out from Ben Bella, who are the publishers of the China Study, which is uh, fundamental to this whole all this information out about um, plant-based diet. So by Dr. Colin Campbell. And I was able, I've been able to interview him personally for my book, which I'm very excited about. Oh, and if you do sign up for the Plant-Based Blueprint or the Teleclass or just my newsletter, I have a newsletter you can sign up for at LandingMuleLath.com. I'll keep you posted about um, upcoming information about when the book will be released. So that's a good way to stay in touch. Great. Thank you. Uh, folks, I mentioned briefly we do have another wellness webinar coming up next Tuesday. It will be May 8th. It starts at 12 noon. Our speaker will be Ben Hogben from Ithaca College. He is also a lecturer, uh, uh, adjunct faculty at Tompkins Cortland Community College on gerontology. And he's, his topic is going to be successful aging through the mind, body, and spirit. And you can sign up on for that on the SCRLC website. We also have a couple more sessions coming up on May 29th will be Rebecca Sigin. She's talking about food and physical activity environments, how your community can be set up and also even just your own personal space so that to have a positive impact on your eating and on your likelihood of physical activity. And in June 17th, Joanne Marshall will come back. She is the one who did Qigong and Tai Chi recently and last summer did yoga for your health. She's going to do Pilates for your health. And that's June 17th. We don't even have the registration available for that yet. But I look forward to seeing you all again hopefully next week. And I thank you all for attending. And thank you so much, Lanny. This was really, yes, really helpful. My pleasure. Appreciate good, it. Good, good, good. Thank look you. Look forward to talking with you again. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. Bye.